Okay, so um, hope you're all doing well. Um, I wanted to show you this poster that was made um, a while ago from our lab. And I'm using it for two reasons. One, it's to talk about uh, research posters and two, tell you another um, aspect of this caterpillar saliva. So the first thing I wanna do is um, look at the poster with you all and talk a little bit about posters in general. Obviously posters, research posters are an important um, way to convey scientific information to the scientific community. And so actually a lot of time should be taken into making a really good poster that's easy to read and follow for your audience. Again, whenever you think about scientific writing, you should always be thinking about your audience. Now this poster would normally be um, colored with colored pictures and things like that and looking more attractive. So you're looking at a PDF copy of that poster. And, but I think it's enough to get you an idea. So some of the things about research conferences is they can vary in size quite a bit from, you know, a nice intimate conference might have 50 to 100 people, 20 to, 20 to 50, 20 to 100 or so. It's kind of a small conference. Usually there will be a poster session with these as, along with a talks that are usually in one room. So it's usually quite focused. And then you can have these mega conferences where you might have a, couple thousand people at it and you may have three or four days of nothing but um, talks going on and they may have five to ten different 15 20 different talks going on at any given moment along with poster sessions that while they have designated times usually are put up in the morning or the night before and left up the entire day and then usually taken down and another set of posters go up and so you're dealing with, usually in these different conferences, um, your poster needs to be able to convey a pretty quick message um, without a lot of, um, because what's happening is a lot of times in these big conferences, people are walking down, they're getting to information overload, dealing with too many presentations or talks. And so you need to be able to capture their attention you're going to have different people coming by your poster. Some are just going to be walking around the poster hall, just kind of looking at some titles. They haven't really bothered to look at their, their book, and so they're not looking for specific posters, or maybe they're just walking around looking for somebody they might know so they can talk um, and gather some information. So usually, at this point, people are usually pretty tired, but on their feet, especially when you're talking about the third or fourth day. So you want to make a poster that's short and gets the message out. Most posters and presentations should have more space, empty space, or as much, nearly as much empty space as their actual words and text. You don't want to take your research paper and just put it on the board. Even this poster here might be a little bit too wordy. But the point is, is you really want to get it so it's easy to see four to five feet away. And so the fonts can vary, but usually you're talking around fonts of around 50 to, to 80 or more for things like titles. And again, you'll see different recommendations, but you know, you might have fonts of around 30 something. It kind of depends um, a little bit, but and you can find easier or better recommendations online. And then the text is usually around 20 something. The idea again is that you can stand four or five feet away and look at this poster and still be able to read it without having to get right up next to it for the average person. I think some things can be improved on this particular poster. I think things like the conclusion statement could have been bulleted. I don't really think the references would need to have been in there necessarily, unless you're wanting them to, to clue in on some particular references. In this case, I actually used the reference for this research paper is a way for them to look for. It. And sometimes if I want to get my name out there, I'll even pump, um, print off lots of PDFs of the actual paper or the actual poster. So that when a student or, or when a person comes by and they want to read about the poster or whatnot, 
um, and I know they're tired, I might just give, they can pick out a handout and it'll be the exact poster. So I printed these off as handouts, or I might actually print off the paper too, depending on how much paper and so forth. But anyway, I, I usually print off about 60 or 70 of these. And the idea was I figured somebody would take it with them, they can look at it later. Uh, maybe more likely they would cite the paper. So that was, you know, the idea about science is you want to get people to cite your research if they, they deem it important. Because again, citation, if it's not cited or and it's just completely ignored, it's almost as if it doesn't exist in some regards. So one of the things about science is getting your name out there and getting citations. So again, I think this poster was pretty good, except that I think you know some of the font could have been a little bit bigger. Um, this conclusions maybe could have been stretched down or spread out. But again, it's still pretty short. We're talking the introductions like literally like a you know, a very small paragraph. The methods are practically a small paragraph where the pictures are illustrated. Now, normally you, hopefully you'd be around to help um, lead somebody through this, but somebody should be able to look at it and have an idea of what is going on, even if you're not there to present it to them, so to speak. Um, figures should, must always have figure legends, whether it be in articles or even I recommend in posters. And figure legends should be able to stand on their own. This is kind of a general rule when you're talking about writing a research paper. Somebody should be able to read your figure legend and have a pretty good idea of what you did and what the results mean without having to go back and read the paper or a full text. So figure legends, like I said, should stand on their own. And so like this figure legend, if I zoom in, I wonder if this will allow me to zoom in, but uh, let's see if I can download it real quick. Maybe the colors will show up. So if you zoom in, here is what is kind of going on. So this says the evidence of caterpillar labial saliva suppresses the infectivity, I don't like this space here, uh, potential bacterial pathogens. So this must have been some type of centering tool, but anyway, that kind of throws that off a little bit. Um, have your contact information to be on your poster so somebody can email you later, because again, part of science is getting out there and um, networking. So you need to be able to learn to network in science, because a lot of science projects are too big to be only a uh, a lone wolf, so to speak. People that publish a lot usually have a big research team associated with them. So anyway, this poster, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Um, again, you're familiar with glucose oxidase. It makes um, hydrogen peroxide by breaking down glucose into gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And as you recall, hydrogen peroxide um, has the ability to kill bacteria or destroy, you know, kill or destroy bacteria. So if you even you're, you know, when you're scratched, you can get a little bottle of hydrogen peroxide. You might use that to clean out your wound. It all bubbles up and so forth. It is also killing your own cells often. But anyway, you know how I'd shown in previous presentations and, and as you read in papers, um, glucose oxidase was important in helping to suppress or lower plant defenses. Well, this caterpillar saliva glucose oxidase um, may have a, a ability to protect the caterpillar from eating back when it eats bacterial pathogens from not becoming infected. Just like any other organism, bacteria, you know, bacteria can infect caterpillars. It happens mostly through septicemia, which is when it gets into the blood of a caterpillar, maybe through a nick or a wound, and can build up a big infection inside the animal. So it's good for the caterpillars to keep the bacterial load lowered, but those that are pathogens lowered in its body. And so glucose oxidase may do this. So when it eats the plants that it's feeding on, um, that hydrogen peroxide may lower uh, potential pathogens. 
And so what I did to test that experiment again was do a surgery on a caterpillar to remove the labial salivary glands. So I removed the labial salivary glands by doing the surgery. And so again, I would have caterpillars that could secrete saliva and could not secrete saliva. And again, their saliva has glucose oxidase in it. How do I know whether the surgery was successful? Well, I used this dab stain. So if you go down to this um, graph here, you can see these are glass fiber discs that allow the caterpillar to feed on with sucrose and glucose. And so when it fed on, on the leaf disc and um, it had the saliva present, the, the uh, glass fiber disc became brown because of the staining for hydrogen peroxide called dab stain. So these discs became brown because of the caterpillar's ability to secrete saliva and glucose oxidase and break down that glucose to hydrogen peroxide. So the, here you can see the surgery is really successful. So these are the ablated caterpillars and these are the ca mock caterpillars, meaning the surgery was performed, but no salivary glands were removed. And then what I did is I allowed these caterpillars to feed on diet coated with bacteria. So we added some extra bacteria onto the diet. Some of the bacteria, these bacteria that um, we used are present everywhere. So they're ubiquitous. And so they have things like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Serrata or Serratia marsins. Um, these are two different bacteria that are present and common in the environment. If you as a human are immune competent, these bacteria can cause you harm that could kill you. But otherwise they're pretty, you know, usually your body can handle them. Well, what we found is this is the percent of survival of caterpillars that are fed on these different diets coated with these bacteria. And you'll see a very similar result among them. Caterpillars that did not have a salivary glands, they did not have salivary glands, died at a much higher rate than those with salivary glands or, um, and so forth. So let me get to make that clear for you. So here's ablated with bacteria. Here's ablated with bacteria and the percentage of survival is around 25% for serratius marsins and around 40% for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But um, if they had their salivary glands present like this one, the mock with bacteria and the mock with bacteria, you see their survival is around 70% for serratius marsins and around 45% or excuse me, 45% for serratius marsins and around 70% um, for the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now let's go back and look at these graphs because we're all clear on this. So here's ablated with bacteria, ablated no bacteria. So they didn't die. So it wasn't the surgery that was killing them. It was the bacteria killing them. But if the salivary glands are present, their survival is equal to no bacteria. So you can see how much of a difference that surgery, removing the salivary glands and, the, and feeding the bacteria had on their infection rate. Again, ablated with no bacteria, the caterpillars do fine. They don't have their salivary glands, but they're not feeding on diet coated with bacteria. There's still some bacteria present, but again, not the higher levels. And then if you see they have their salivary glands present and they're feeding a bacteria, they're doing just fine. So again, this provided evidence that the salivary glands were providing some protection for the caterpillar against the bacteria. That's even true for our own selves. Our saliva is a first line of defense against a lot of bacteria, particularly ones that may cause cavities. I myself actually have had a salivary gland surgery that removed one of my parotid glands. Before that, I hardly ever had cavities. And I don't have that many nowadays, but I went through a spell where I had quite a few more cavities after my salivary gland surgery. So maybe there's a correlation. But e either way, for this caterpillar, apparently the salivary glands provided some protection against um, potential bacterial pathogens. So was it due to the glucose oxidase? Is there something about the salivary glands that help to kill off the bacteria? 
So let me zoom in a little bit better so you can see this next slide too, or this next frame. If you go down here and you look at these um, petri dishes with um, bacterial medium, you know, medium in it that the bacteria can grow in, I think it's LB auger, which is really well known for growing bacteria. And then we punch little holes in them with like a cork bore. And then we fill those holes either with salivary gland extract with or glucose oxidase, always with some glucose so that hydrogen peroxide can form. You'll see that there's a bacterial clearing that takes place. Let me zoom in a little bit more. So you can see, look at the clearing. So this was a lot of bacteria that grew. So if, the, if this is glucose oxidase or salivary gland extracts, you can see that the bacteria cleared thanks to the enzymes from the saliva. So this provided evidence that the saliva is providing anti antimicrobial properties. Notice over here that you can see that the bacteria grow irrespective. So if this is water, or if this is glucose oxidase by itself and without the glucose, you don't see any kind of clearing. But if you see salivary gland extracts with glucose, then you see this huge clearing take place. That's, that's substantial. There's also circumstantial evidence that glucose oxidase is important. If you recall, I mentioned honeybees also make glucose oxidase and they actually put their, this glucose oxidase into their honey, hoping to keep microbes out of their honey. It's not just the pure rich sugar that's keeping the bacteria levels low. It's also the fact that they put some glucose oxidase in there, the honeybees, to help protect their honey. So again, this provided additional evidence that this was affecting um, the caterpillar survival against bacteria. So it seems that this glucose oxidase might not just be for helping protect caterpillars from feeding on plants like tobacco by lowering the induction of nicotine, but also may have and I'm not sure what came first, the chicken or the egg, but, but maybe also have evolved to provide some protection to the caterpillar against bacterial pathogens. But again, we've demonstrated, at least in a lab setting, that it does have some effect on um, their survival. So if they have a salivary glands present, their chances of surviving are much higher even in the presence of the bacteria. And we see that it's clearing it. In fact, here's an example. This is a quantitative data of what you saw qualitatively down here. So we measured the clearing. So if you look at this figure here, this is the actual diameter of bacterial clearing for Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so, here we have zero milligrams of saliva extract or glucose oxidase, but we have the glucose present. We see no clearing. So if there's no saliva or no glucose oxidase, there's no clearing. If we add one milligram of salivary gland extract or glucose oxidase, we see a pretty substantial clearing. It seems like it gets more clear, obviously, for um, the glucose oxidase. That's a straight dark line. And then if we add 10 milligrams of salivary gland extract or glucose oxidase, we see even more clearing. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Again, over here, you can see some of the figure legend. This tells you which ones are salivary gland extract. So this is salivary gland extract. Um, this is another salivary gland extract and water. So again, what's happening is if it's if none of that's present, there's no clearing taking place. And we see this is also true for the bacteria Serratia marsins, where if you have um, zero 
cell regular extract or zero glucose oxidase, you see zero clearing. But one milligram of cell regular extract or glucose oxidase, you see a clearing. And then over here, you see a similar, similar trend where the more cell regular extract or glucose oxidase, you see more clearing. So again, we kept the conclusions pretty short because you want them just to read the poster and walk away. The caterpillars that could not secrete saliva had significantly higher levels of mortality when feeding on a diet treated with either bacterium than caterpillars that could secrete saliva when feeding on equal levels of bacteria treated diet. Our evidence demonstrates for the first time that insect saliva in situ can provide protection against bacterial pathogens and evidence that the salivary gland enzyme glucose oxidase appears to provide antimicrobial properties. And again, this could probably be fixed up a little bit. So anyway, this was a good study. This was done with one of my first grad students. Um, studying Kwan is what he went by here. He is now a um, PhD scientist at Iowa State University and um, has had a successful career as a, a scientist over there. So he, had, he got his doctorate after finishing his master's with me. But he was one of my first grad students. Uh, Spencer Williams was one of the students that was a high school student in, in Arkansas and then traveled with me and started school here at Western back when I first started. And then James White is actually a local guy that got his master's degree with me also. Um, he didn't stay in the field, but he has a successful career um, working as a steam fitter. So again, a lot of people might not necessarily stay a biologist, but it's cool that they have that experience. Anyway, that finishes up explaining a little bit about posters. So again, one of the things I'm hoping to do is that maybe you'll do a poster in this class. We have traditionally done so, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. Anyway, thanks for listening.